Hey folks, it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History Modern. Today, we are going to be learning about the Ming Dynasty. So this is going to be the Chinese dynasty that follows the fall of the Yuan Dynasty. So identify three things that made the Mongol Empire significant, please. Today, we are covering topic 2.5 on the Ming Empire. So that means we are dealing with topic 2.5 from the AP course curriculum. So your objective for today, explain the intellectual and cultural effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450. Okay. Let's get started. The Ming Empire, the Ming Dynasty, will be around from the 14th to 17th centuries. So please remember that 14th century is the 1300s, so 17th century is the 1600s, right? Between the, zero, between the years zero and 100 is the first century. So that means between the years 101 to 200 is the second century. So that means the year 205 is third century, right? It continues on. That's why we are currently in the 21st century. So originally the Ming Dynasty was founded by Zhu Yuanzhang, a military commander of peasant origins. His name is less important um, than his heritage. So he is going to spend most of his life, his young life, alternating between being a beggar and living in a monastery, a Buddhist monastery to survive. In the 1340s, he will leave the monastery to join a rebellion against the Mongols. He will be given small groups of men to lead, and eventually he gathers more and more people, organizes his armies, until he overthrows the Mongols, the Yuan Dynasty, and takes back most of China. So in 1368, he declares himself Hong Wu, the emperor, and he vows to return China to its imperial Chinese traditions, right? His goal here is to remove all Mongol influences. So, a couple things about the Ming Dynasty. The Forbidden City, as we know it, will be really built up during this time. And it's really only going to be the Ming Dynasty that we see China looks beyond its own mainland in terms of exploration. It's going to be brief, but the exploration by Zheng Ha is going to be significant. So, one of the things that we see is that towards the end of the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongols were facing lots of internal rebellions. This will push the Mongol forces out of China ultimately, and Hong Wu will reestablish China under its more traditional organization, complete with tribute states in Korea, Vietnam, and Tibet. And he will reestablish the Tang government structure with the civil service exam. So, one of the things Hong Wu is gonna do is he will move the capital out of Beijing to Nanjing and reestablish the Confucian government system. So that means he's going to stop a lot of the innovations that the Mongols introduced, including paper money, and said he will return China to silver coins for currency. He will really stop all trade along the Silk Roads with Central Asia and the Middle East. He will severely limit imports and foreign visitors, and it turns out doing all of these things is really bad for your economy. So. 
eventually we see a return to the yuan structure for organizing large tracts of land like the provincial structure and hereditary professional categories. So he's going to have to back off on some of his anti-Mongol policies because they're just not good policies. So he realizes as well, Hong Wu realizes that he needs to revive the scholar gentry system to really um, revive Chinese civilization. So without the scholar gentry, you can't have a full return to the Chinese idealistic vision of the past that Hong Wu's going for. Remember, you have to remember, you have to understand that a lot of what this first Ming emperor's goals are are primarily a reaction against the Mongols, and he's desiring to return to how he understands China to be in the past. And this is a very idealized version, right? Because it's been over a hundred years. And so his understanding of how China functioned during the Tang and Song dynasty is more based on tradition than necessarily reality. And yet, he will reestablish the Confucian-based examination system and make it more complex. So the exams will take several days to complete. Those who passed the initial exam will then be eligible to take more exams, and these will be given every three years. Test takers competed for degrees and then for positions in the bureaucracy. Women were still unable to participate in this system and academic uh, programs, imperial schools and regional colleges will be restored. So one of the things that we saw during the Mongol period was a reduction in Confucian influence and that is all going to be restored during the Ming Dynasty. So let's think about political reforms. Neo-Confucians, remember these Confucian fundamentalists, increased their influence, supporting obedience to the state. And yet Tang Wu is going to seek to limit the influence of administrators, right? He doesn't want his government employees more powerful than he is. So he will abolish the position of chief minister, Documents that were considered threatening to him would be censored. Public beatings were given to those bureaucrats found guilty of corruption or incompetence. And he's trying to remove the corruption that had been present in the Mongol leadership towards the end of the Yuan dynasty. And he's taking very harsh measures against it. Remember, this isn't a guy who grew up in elite Chinese families. He was a peasant. He's literally begged for food. He's had to fight to get here. So he has very little patience for useless administrators and for corrupt bureaucrats. He will declare that the emperor's wife should only come from humble family origins so that will keep the elite families from gathering more and more power. And in fact, he will exile anyone who he views as a political rival to far-flung provinces. So one of the things we see Hong Wu's going to do is to try and introduce measures to improve, improve the lives of peasants. Oh, nope, I don't have a slide on this yet. So he was a peasant, right? So he knows how hard it is. He wants to try and improve their quality of life. And this is standard beginning of the dynastic cycle stuff, right? The new emperors always do this. So he's going to build up public works, 
open up new lands for agriculture, lower forced labor demands, and promote cottage industry, so handicraft, handmade products industries. Rural landlords will ally themselves with bureaucrats, and so peasants will become tenants of the landlords. So this doesn't actually really work. He's, this will actually lead to an increase in the gap between rich and poor. Women will continue to be subordinate to men. Although elite women, just like before, will be able to try and manipulate power through their husbands and sons. The social status of non-elite women, though, is pretty grim under Neo-Confucianism, right? Your only goal in life, your only duty in life is to basically have sons. Um, and if you can't do that, then you're a failure as a woman. So let's talk about Emperor Yongle. Emperor Yongle is the second emperor that you should know for the Ming Dynasty. He's the third emperor total for the Ming Empire, um, and he will govern during the 15th century. So he is going to be really interested in the outside world. So he will sponsor the building of the Forbidden City. He will reopen China to foreign trade. He's going to support outside exploration. And he actually seizes power through a coup. So he returns the capital to Beijing. Remember, the Forbidden City had originally been Kublai Khan's territory. It was a walled off area where the Mongols could live as Mongols in yurts with goats wandering around. Now he's going to take the walled off area and build this very elaborate palace for the royal family to reside in. One of the reasons why he will support maritime exploration is because the Mongols, although no longer the dominant power in Eurasia that they were in the 1200s, Mongols will still control much of Central Asia. And the Mongols and the Ming are not on great terms. So he wants to have China participating in international trade again, but he can't use the Silk Roads. So instead, he will support maritime exploration. Please watch this video. It's not very long, but it's going to uh, tell you about the Forbidden City, give you a glimpse of what it looks like on the inside. It's pretty neat. Do I talk more about Ming? All right, yeah, I do. All right, in what ways did the Ming Empire continue or discontinue Mongol practices? And what were some of Hong Wu's political reforms? Okay. We see a lot of economic growth during this time. So China had industries that were in high demand. People in the rest of the world wanted silk. They wanted tea. They wanted porcelain and fine ceramics. And so in terms of trade, China was in a really strong position. Merchants were able to reap huge profits. And when Zheng Ha, who I will talk about more in a moment, when Zheng Ha travels, around the Indian Ocean, he will take Chinese goods to new markets and create increased demand. In return, what China really wants is silver. And this demand is going to increase. We will also see that fine arts flourish during this time. Painters, literacy, um, literature, in part because of the woodblock printing um, brought over from Korea. We see that there's 
not a lot of mining going on because they don't want to mine too much silver and thus devalue silver coins. But this means that the metal available for tools is limited, which makes metal tools for farmers more expensive. We see that agriculture will grow and peak in the 1400s and stay level for about a century. We see it's because of the general warming of the Earth's surface. New weaving techniques are introduced and all of this leads to rapid population growth. So, because farmers grew staple crops like wheat, millet, barley, and rice, the increased food supply allows for increased population. So when you're comparing the Ming to the Sung, we see that the Ming do not have nearly as much technological innovation as the Sung, but they are producing more goods. And yet around 1200, the plagues from the bubonic plague will have a negative impact on the populations of Asia and Europe. The population growth leads to deforestation and an increase in the price of wood, so there's an impact on the environment. And we see that as Europe discovers the New World, the Americas, crops from the New World will be introduced to China as well, which will lead to more population growth. Things like corn, sweet potatoes, and peanuts. So that means in the 14th century, China's population is about 80 million. By the 16th century, by 600, sorry, by 1600, it's 120 million. By 1800, it's 300 million. This is huge. Interestingly enough, we also see during this time that Korea and Japan pass up China technologically. So let's talk a little bit about some Ming achievements. Well, one thing to know is they're gonna write some novels, but more importantly, porcelain. You might have heard of like a Ming vase, um, Mingware. That's why I mean we call like China, uh, chi like plates. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as China because the porcelain came from China. Um, this very distinctive blue on white style is standard for porcelain that's going to come from the Ming dynasty. We see also furniture, lacquered screens, silk, all part of Ming production too. All right, but sea trade, let's talk a little bit about sea trade. There's this brief blip in Chinese history where they're interested in maritime exploration. Emperor Yongle will sponsor this, but it's going to be Zheng Ha who really seeks to explore. He is a eunuch, so that means he's been castrated. He um, Eunuchs were considered more trustworthy um, by the royal court, and there was lots of them, especially it would be eunuchs who would... Uh, protect the empress and the concubines because the idea was, well, a eunuch can't get one of the emperor's mistresses pregnant. He was also a Muslim, though not a Buddhist, and he's going to be really entrusted by Yongle to go on a series of trips. He has these giant ships, and he's going to go throughout the Indian Ocean, um, around Southeast Asia, and even Africa. He has a good knowledge of the Middle East because both his father and his grandfather, who were also Muslim, had gone on the Hajj. They had gone on pilgrimage to Mecca. So they had done some traveling to the Middle East already. The fact that he was Muslim made trade with India easier because the governing bodies in India at this time were Muslim, either the Delhi or the Mughals. He will... His travels will add 50 new tribute states, but will not dramatically increase trade. 
the voyages will stop pretty dramatically as soon as Yongle and Zheng Ha both die. So you can see how far he went. This is unusual, right? You had Malaysian, for the most part, um, sailors really dominating the South China Sea. You didn't have state-sponsored ships going from Beijing into the Indian Ocean. Remember, in Confucian belief, merchants are at the bottom of the barrel. So why did China all of a sudden stop all expeditions in 1433? Well, there's a few theories. Generally, the idea is xenophobia, right? It's anti-other people. Theory number one is that this desire for maritime exploration was really just a pet project of Emperor Yongle. It didn't have a lot of broad government support. And so without the emperor pushing for it, there wasn't a lot of incentive to continue. Theory number two, the commercial opportunities that these explorations were expected to bring about were less significant than had been predicted. And so it wasn't worth the cost. In general, Confucian scholars were against these trading policies. And the new emperor wanted to really differentiate himself from Emperor Yongle. And one of the ways he did that was by canceling these expeditions. So part of this is, a, in fact, xenophobia, the shift to the traditional rather than foreign involvement. There's no need to actively obtain foreign goods. Everyone wants to do trade with China. They want this porcelain so desperately, especially Europe. So why go out and seek it? Let them come to us. We see that China will continue to be active in East and Southeast Asian trade, but they've essentially lost their chance to be a dominant world trading power because of the fact that they canceled these explorations and basically stopped taking an active role in Indian Ocean maritime trade, they left the door wide open for Europe to take that position. So when the Portuguese and Dutch arrive in the Indian Ocean and establish a monopoly over it, the Chinese really have no one but themselves to blame. So the idea of China being very pure but surrounded by barbarians is one that's going to prevail in China. So foreign rulers were expected to kowtow, to literally bow, crawl on your knees, forehead against the ground in the presence of the emperor. In 1390, we see the first imperial edict issued to limit Chinese overseas commerce. And in the 15th century, we start to see Europeans arriving on the scene. So what were the main achievements of the Ming Dynasty? Please watch this crash course on 15th century mariners. It's going to give you a bit of a preview of what we're going to be talking about with Christopher Columbus as well. Now let's do some practice questions. So source-based questions, so pause the video and take a moment to read over this. Which of the following is a valid reason that China did not benefit as greatly as other civilizations from these technologies between 600 and 1450? On which region did the technologies described in the excerpts have the greatest impact, eventually leading to a greater ability to dominate other regions in later time periods.
over which long distance trade route did these technologies spread from their point of origin? So for your summary, please explain the intellectual and cultural effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia between 1200 and 1450. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.